Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. It's Wednesday, so it's time for another midweek mini mail call. Just a normal episode today. So without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, we have a very big package here. This one comes from Philip in the UK. It's so heavy. I can't imagine the, the shipping cost of this. It says FedEx on here. So thank you, Philip, and hi to all my UK viewers. Philip lives in Carlisle. There's a shipping invoice here, which I won't look at because that might spoil things. Sorry, Rami, hitting you with a cardboard box there. Oh boy, there's a lot of stuff in here. I'm gonna have to move this down to the floor. First up, a big bag of ribbon cables. Next up, we got a quick stick joystick here. We have a heat sink fan combo. We have a really heavy heat sink fan combo. Looks like we got some books here. And uh, a tie, <laughs> a tie. Here's a Microsoft Press book, Running MS-DOS, sixth edition. The all-time best-selling guide to getting the most out of DOS. Three million copies sold. Ooh. Oh, hey, we got a copy of Half-Life 2 strategy guide as well. It's old, but it's still incredibly fun. And if you've never played through Half-Life 2, I highly recommend you pick up a copy on Steam or whatever, you know, game store and play through it. And we have another game here. It looks like Dai Katana and the official guide for it as well. Looks like we have a game controller. There are several more PCI cards here. This looks like an MFM ISA hard drive controller card. And here is an AST fast RAM card. And it looks like it's fully populated with RAM. So that's excellent. And we have an ISA card. This looks like a multifunction CGA clock sort of all in one card for PC 8-bit ISA. And we have another RAM card, ISA, weird connectors. And then we have another RAM card. We got another joystick here. Oh, this just keeps going. There's so many cards in here. This is amazing. Looks like another MFM hard drive controller card, an AST EGA card, 16-bit ISA multifunction IO IDE floppy controller. This looks like an ISA VGA card of some kind. Ooh, and this seems like a rarity, an 8-bit VGA card, an actual bespoke 8-bit card. It looks like a serial ISA card. This card's a little bit of an oddball. It says Mountain IBM QIC Host Adapter. ISA serial parallel card. Here's an XT motherboard, has 8-bit slots on it. Looks like it's probably an XT8088 type processor. And here's a 386DX motherboard, and this actually appears to have those weird backwards slots. We've got some RAM and a thumb drive in there. 8-bit ISA hard drive controller. We have another 386DX motherboard. It's just like that one. It takes those RAM cards that are backwards. <laughs> and one more motherboard in the box. This is a 286. It also takes one of those RAM cards, but this one's weird. It has extra ports built in. So that is everything in the box. It's just wild how much PC stuff there is here. Philip, thank you very much for sending this. Um, we're gonna have to take a look on the bench and it'll have to be a quick look because it would take me forever to make a video testing all of this stuff. But we'll at least take a quick gander at all the cards up close as opposed to me holding it up into the camera. Philip sent so much stuff. I think what we're gonna do is start with the adapter cards he sent. So these two piles right here. I have my test bench here. This is the Pentium. First, I'll check out some of these cards. There'll be too many to test them fully, but be able to try some of them. And then we can move on to those motherboards. All right, so I unwrapped all the ISA cards. Let's just take a quick look at these cards. This card here is an MFM hard drive controller. Well, ST506, so it could be a RLL controller for all I know. HC-101-A1, and then the brand is TransTech, T-E-Q-U-E, Company Limited. I'm not gonna test the MFM cards right now. Next up is another MFM hard drive controller card. This one is different in that it has 
hard drive and a floppy controller port on it. Western Digital chipset. This card is a WD1006V-SR2. I think I actually have one of these and it's actually quite a good card, 16-bit. So you require an AT. This does not have an onboard BIOS, but it's a very good card because it's documented all the jumpers and it has a floppy controller. So it's extra good for testing those old drives. And here's another Western Digital 16-bit card. And this is a WD1003-WAH. So it's a little bit older than that one we were just looking at. And it does not have the floppy controller port on it, but also pretty decent MFM hard drive controller. Next up is this, an 8-bit CGA slash mono multifunction card. These are actually pretty cool and very useful for XTs because you can put this in and it eliminates a bunch of different cards. So this here is the video chip, which does CGA. and looks like it does 640 by 400 color as well. So I don't know exactly what kind of monitor that uses. Probably a multi-sync monitor like my Mitsubishi. Monochrome color though, color, mono, CGA, everything. Okay, I cleared away everything under the bench because it kept focusing on that stuff and not the card. So this has a nine pin connector here. This is for the monitor. This is a serial port. There's a composite video. Probably here has parallel port, game port. Oh, it's labeled printer, game. And there's another connector there. Could be another serial port, a light pen connector. We have two more serial ports. How's that possible? Oh, wait, this port here says mouse. So I don't know what that's all about, but you have two more serial ports and you have a floppy drive controller. So this thing is doing quite a lot. Oh, and of course it's got a clock as well. This socket right here is required. If you want to use the second serial port, you put an 8250 or a 16550 in there. So these cards are really good. And I think I have one of these in one of my computers. I can't remember which, but um, yeah, sort of it's nice that they have silk screen markings for the jumpers, the screen resolutions, stuff like that. Mouse setting, IRQ2345. So this is mouse port it must be some bus mouse or something, but it's using a nine pin connector. So that's a little strange. Juco, QA pass. There's a serial number. That's it. There's nothing else on this card. It just says G7-B and then the Roman numeral two right there. And this video chip here says VDL from 1989, but there's no other markings on it. These cards were really inexpensive when they were new. And if you have an XT class machine and you're trying to add a bunch of functionality to it and you're looking for cards to buy on eBay, these types of cards are a really good bet. They should sell relatively cheaply because it's kind of unbranded and it's probably out of Taiwan or something like that in the late 80s. But the fact that it adds a clock, it adds a ton of functionality to your XT. They're quite useful in that regard. I was about to try to test this in my test bench here, and I can't. It's too long and it hits the CPU in any configuration in any of the three ISA slots. So we'll have to try testing this in a little bit of time. All right, next card, Sang Labs ET4000AX. This is a VGA card. Doesn't have all of its RAM populated. These are, what, four 256. So two of these chips makes 256K, I think. So this should have 512K on it. You can now go up to a megabyte, obviously, for some SVGA type action. Let's see if this card works. This will fit in this motherboard. I can imagine this card probably works fine. Okay, there we go, it just came right up. So that's awesome, that works. Very rudimentary testing just to see it power on, but I'm gonna put a check mark on there just to say that I've actually tried it. Next up, we have this, which is also a Sang ET3000EX, but it's an 8-bit VGA card. So regular VGA connector, pretty awesome. VGA Sync BIOS from 1988. These are just extra so used. These cards are really useful in that you just can pop them into an XT and you don't have to worry about clearance problems when you have the extra 16-bit part. A lot of times, a 16-bit card, like the one we just looked at here, this will work potentially in an XT, but this one, of course, definitely works. And it just means plugging in a monitor is that much easier. So let's just pop it in the motherboard right here. Hook up the video cable. Let's just see if this thing works. I don't think I have any of these cards, although I do have some VGA cards that work in XTs. And there we go, came right up. 
try to enter the BIOS. Get some more text on there than just, there you go. Yeah, that seems to work. Of course, you have a performance penalty by using an 8-bit slot, especially on a machine like this that's got PCI and 16-bit. But sometimes, like I mentioned, it's very useful. I'll put it on this white sticker here. It's very useful to have a card like that. So awesome, those work. Next up is this. It's an Adaptech PCI SCSI card. It's an AVA-2902E slash I. And it doesn't have the internal connector here, although I suppose I could just add the pin header on. It has the external one. But I don't think these actually support Bi they don't have a BIOS of any kind, so they really only, they don't work for booting the computer. I stuck it in the motherboard here back with the PCI VGA card. Because there's no BIOS on here, it doesn't really support booting. You have to have DOS drivers or Windows drivers, so they're not super useful. But maybe it'll surprise me. It has some kind of internal BIOS inside there. I don't know. We'll see if it shows anything here on the computer other than boot error. Uh, yeah, if this had a, an Adaptic BIOS, it would be saying Adaptic SCSI controller on here right now, and it's not. Okay, next is a Wi-Fi card. It's a Belkin F5D7000 54G. I am assuming this supports WPA. And to be honest, it's funny, I've never actually used a Wi-Fi PCI card in my life, specifically because I have Ethernet everywhere, and the bench here, everywhere around my house and pretty much everywhere I've always lived, I've always ran ethernet cables. So I just never had a need for, for this kind of thing. USB dongles are good in a pinch, but um, you know these are a little less useful. All right, and here's that mountain card, which I just didn't know what this was. IBM slash OIC-02 host adapter from 1983. Anyone have any ideas what this is? 25 pin connector there, just TTL logic. Uh, there's a gal here, so that's something. That just likely does the address decoding here. Um, I don't have documentation. There's nothing on the back here. That would just decode these address lines, maybe these IRQs, something like that. Otherwise, it's all 74LS logic on here, so if someone can let me know what this is. That would be great. Otherwise, it's definitely useful. I can reuse this gal because that's not a pal. I can erase that. And then 74LS logic chips can be used for other things. All right, and then we have this, which is, I guess, just a multi-IO serial board. So nothing super fancy. Serial, parallel, that's it, really. Yeah, 82450, that's the serial controller. Oh, Wise Technologies. Well, that's interesting. That serial parallel board. So this must have been from some PC compatible they made. A couple configuration jumpers, I suppose. FCC ID on the back, if anyone wants to see what that is. I've re-enabled the built-in IDE port on this computer so it can boot up into DOS, hopefully. It's kind of hanging. That's weird. I wonder if this card is causing some, oh no, okay, starting MS-DOS, just a little slow. Checking the configuration, we do see serial in parallel, so I guess that card is working, cool. All right, we have another card here. This is another dual serial port. This one's made by STB, 1986. This is an 8250 serial controller. Almost certainly that's what's under there. The backplate got ripped off a little bit, so that's seen better days. <laughs> In fact, it's, it is broken. It actually pulled the brass stand off right out of this uh, connector here. So it could be changed out if I really needed it. There's a jumper there for ring and five volts. So that's the ring here. It's on both ports actually. And I guess here it lets you set the jumpers for each of the two serial ports. And this is maybe the base IO, but there's no configuration info on this thing. Maybe there's information floating around on the internet. I'll plug it in this computer here and we'll just see if it at least detects two serial ports. And there it is, it's showing up as COM2 and COM3. So I guess that's how that the dip switches were configured. And the IRQ was only set for one of the two ports, but that's not needed to just detect them at least. When it comes to the serial controller chips, if we look at this multi-IO card here for the XT, 
it has an extra 40 pin dip socket here, that would take one of these two chips. So I'll probably, actually this is a little bit more useful. I should probably just yank one of these, stick it on here so I can uh, have a fully populated two serial ports on an XT. Next up, we have this 16-bit IDE floppy controller, dual serial, parallel, and game port. These are very, very common in the old days when you were building 286s and 386s and 486s. These were pretty much in every one of those systems. Well, not 286s, but 386s and 486s. Once all the clone boards started coming out, this is what pretty much everyone had. When I used to build computers in the um, late 80s, early 90s for my job after school, this is what you used in all of them. So they were very ubiquitous back then, very inexpensive. Nowadays, they don't seem as cheap as they should be. You look on eBay, the prices are kind of ridiculous. But the reason why you'd really want one of these in your, say, 386, of course, is the IDE port and the floppy port. So you could plug in compact flash card or whatever. But the serial ports are useful too. And yeah, so pretty cool. I might as well just pop this in. Let's see if we see the game ports. Almost certainly this, this thing will work. These are very, very reliable things. I am going to need to go into the BIOS though and disable the IDE port, the onboard IDE. The internal IDE bus is going to conflict with what's on this card. So you have to turn it off. Oh, and then I'm not gonna be able to boot. Uh, you know what, let's just leave it. Let's just see what happens if we leave that enabled. Nothing's actually plugged into this, no IDE hard drive. So I hope it doesn't conflict because I wanna be able to run and check it to see if the ports are there. <laughs> it just rebooted the machine. Oh. But <laughs> why did it act like it rebooted and now it's booting? That's very odd. Okay, so things are a little weird. It's showing three COM ports. I know I have them disabled on the motherboard, so that's weird. Yeah, most likely this card is working. It most definitely does not have three COM ports, so that was a bit weird. It could be just a configuration. There's a model number on here, TK. 82C863, which is basically just the model number of this chip right here. SST2845E. Usually when you look at jumper configurations on these, it's just everything to the left, like it is right here. On the back, it just says ASCA 9394. So yeah, right around that time period where I was working after school. Well, that was a few years after that, but that's when I was building computers. Okay, next up is this, which is an EGA card. You can always tell EGA cards versus CGA because they have these two that look like RCA connectors, but they're actually not. Typically, neither of these is composite video. These are actually feature connector outputs. This connector here, there would be like boards that would plug into the original IBM card and then use these for light pans or I don't know. If anyone really knows what these were used for, on the original IBM card, please let me know. But I'm pretty sure these are just wired directly to here so that things that plugged into there could, could use those optionally. This card is labeled AST and it's using a chips and technology EGA chipset here. North Star Computers is what's written on here. AST Research, oh, AST 3G plus two. So documentation probably exists for this so that the dip switches can be set properly. 3G plus two, made in Hong Kong by AST Research. There's an AST sticker there as well. And then 1988, 26th week, there's the date code. Yeah, most likely this thing totally works. I think I'll just plug it in as is, take the VGA card out first. Let's see if this works. Of course, to use an EGA card, we're gonna need to use this, the RGB to HDMI, which I have shown recently in some of my videos. I particularly love this project. The great thing about this is no matter how this card is configured with those dip switches, say it's monochrome or it's CGA or EGA or whatever, this thing can support all of those modes. So that's pretty awesome. So I'm gonna plug in the same VGA monitor with this adapter here. Plug this into the Raspberry Pi. And on the monitor, we got the Raspberry Pi color there. That's awesome. All right, well, first I'll try saying it's a PC EGA and sub profiles TGA, but whatever, we'll fix that in a second. Let me power on the computer. See what we get here. Oh, there it is. There is an image there. And it's switched out into EGA mode. This monitor is not ideal here. So let's exit out of the menu here. There it is. 
see if the system boots. Well, I booted up, but it's stuck at my Sound Blaster 16 mixer set command, which is weird. I don't have a Sound Blaster 16 even in here, so I don't know why it's hanging right on there. So I'll just abort the startup process. Okay, so while we wait for that to boot, because I don't know what's happening, it's hanging. Uh, there's a memory module that I got sent here. Toshiba 2 gigabytes. 1 gig SO DIM PC2. Oh, and the bag with the RAM was one of these. Cisco Linksys USB thingy. Wireless network USB adapter. All right, I'm holding down shift key on the keyboard, which on DOS 622, which is what this is, it should abort. What's happening? I don't understand why my computer is so screwed up. All right, there we go. Finally, oh. All right, well, I guess uh, something's wrong with this card. That's weird. So I'm gonna have to put a question mark on this. Go check this out. <laughs> at a future time, trying to look up what the dip switches are. Maybe there's a configuration thing. I don't know. It's it's weird that it booted up mostly and then it had a problem. All right. So there's also this, the Audigy 2 Z5 or ZS from Sound Blaster. And it's a PC card. Comes with a little dongle here. That's nice that that's included. Oh, but even right on here, optical in, optical out. Pretty cool. Don't think I've seen a Laptop card with that. It's got some gold-plated connectors there. That's useful, I suppose. I mean, I don't know. This is definitely probably not any kind of DOS-compatible card. It's not like a Sound Blaster 16 or something. Model number SB0530. So, yeah. If anyone has any thoughts on this card, please let me know. Any, like, thoughts on where to use this, stuff like that? That'd be good to know. All right, let's keep moving here. So a RAM card, an AST fast RAM. Now this has this proprietary connector right here, right? This looks like standard 16 bit, but it's got this going on. These chips are 256. We got MT RAM chips. They have little American flags on them. So eight of these chips is 256K, meaning this is 512, one meg, two megs total. So that's what's on this card. It's got dip switches up here, has a jumper down there. Looked like I had some plastic thing here for helping you pull it out, or maybe that's just for alignment. On the back, just says made in Hong Kong by AST Research. AST was a very popular company back in the day. They made PCs, they made uh, lots of adapter cards and stuff. It's pretty easy to find documentation. So I haven't looked, but I'm pretty sure I'll be able to find the documentation to configure this memory, although this is probably already configured because I think it goes with those motherboards. This this wouldn't work in a normal motherboard. You have to use this, I'm assuming, in an AST system. And then there's this card, which also is proprietary. It's like the 16-bit connectors been flipped. It's got this, what looks like an 8-bit connector, extra connector here for connecting more RAM, I guess. 256K, so this is also 2 megabytes, just like that other card. It does have jumpers here. Thank you for at least putting jumper configurations here. It's a PAT2M Plus. And on the back, not a lot to see, but it is interesting that this is here. And I guess what went there? More RAM, a battery, like a hard drive? <laughs> Could be anything. And there's a second one of these cards here. So also fully populated with two megs of RAM. The jumpers on this are configured for the first memory card, and on this one, they're also configured as the first memory card. All right, so we have a motherboard. Now, this is clearly the motherboard that memory card goes into. Uh, not the AST one, but the, the, the second two I showed. And there are two slots, so you do first and second. This motherboard, if you notice, there's no RAM on board at all. The original 386 motherboards were big. They were much larger than this. So they only once they condensed the chipset, like look at all these chips that make up the chipset. Once they shrunk those down, they were able to put memory right on the board. Or you got a slightly larger motherboard with like SIM slots or something. There were funky designs at first, but this was one of the choices. So you would have to take one of these memory cards here and it would connect that way into the board. So there are two of these that are identical. Let's uh, test this out. So we'll plug this into here. And I'll plug a video card in and we'll see if this thing works. Okay, push it down. Bends the whole motherboard. 
plug in the power. Remember the black wires always go together. Uh, I think it's like if you're if it's red, you're dead when the two reds are together. So always make sure you have the black wires going to the center. I'll just grab this 8-bit video card, which we know works. Stick it in an 8-bit slot. Why not? Okay, I think we're good to go, at least to see it post. Uh, let's see if this works. Turn it on. Got a green light. There we go. CMOS checks some error. Uh, one meg of extended memory. Hmm, that's not working very well. What? Okay, so check this out. Arch 3620 for British Rail Local Systems. Let's run the setup utility by pushing F2. All right, yep, of course there's no CMOS battery on here. Whoever removed that, thank you very much. A very basic Phoenix BIOS. See, hard drive types. Uh, is that a custom? Typically type 47 is one you could type in yourself, but I thought maybe we could type, type in something there, but we cannot. Oh yeah, you can, you just push the down arrow. Oh, great, okay, great, so custom types, very handy. All right, so can we configure the RAM? No, we cannot. So there must be bad memory on this board. It should have two megs of RAM, and it's only showing up with one meg. Display showing up as CGA80. What? Okay, weird. VGA, EJ. Okay, that's something you can set. CPU speed. There's a turbo, probably a turbo input on here. But we can pick what we want. Cool processor not installed. And you can press page up for another screen. So this is some of the stuff you got with 3D6s. Shadow BIOS. This really speeds things up a lot. Memory weight state. I mean, who knows? You need a specific speed of RAM to be able to go to zero weight states. And that's it, these two pages. Pretty cool, F10. And there, it's not booting because I don't have a hard drive controller plugged in. No problem, but yeah, customized for British Rail local systems. But it's also cool that it works. Three, six systems are not super common because they're so often destroyed by battery leakage. Like that one I had on the channel, I don't know, it was a little while ago, it was a three, six motherboard. Totally dead. Why don't I power this off and swap to the other memory card since this motherboard is working. It is very difficult to get this out. It really bends the motherboard a lot because you can't really get a grip. All right, let's try this by pushing down on it and pulling up on it. There we go. Yeah, it's not easy to get out. Let's try the other one out. Let's see if this one shows up as the full two megabytes. I was about to put it in this way. <laughs> That's not going to work. Has to go in this way. Okay, let's see if this one shows up with more than one meg of RAM. Absolutely, positively, these are 256K each. So this is 256, 512, one meg, and here's another meg of RAM on this lower area. So this definitely has two megs on it. And other than these jumpers here for first or second card, which is right there, there is no other options on here to change anything. So I can only think that there's bad memory on here. Okay, and actually, I'm sorry, I wasn't showing this, but it showed up with one meg originally, but then it rebooted. I don't know why I wiggled this card. And uh, now it only shows 640K. Oh, hold on a second. I just realized what's going on here. It is showing up with two, me with two megs. It's... 640K, 384, we can't see, it's not counting that. And then there's 1024 extended. The top part of memory, that 384K, normally like on 286s, that's not, no memory is in that location. All the extra memory would be extended. So you would have 1024 plus the 384K. That's above the 640K. But on a 386, it actually maps that memory into that location. And then it uses those RAM cache options we saw in the BIOS to actually take like the system ROM and also the VGA BIOS and it caches them into the fast memory that is on the RAM card here. And these are 80 nanosecond RAM chips, by the way, so they're pretty fast. So that's why I was miscounting and people will probably scream at their screen, but this is correct. If I configure the second card and I stick it in there and I set the jumpers appropriately, then we would have three megs extended plus 640K and the 384 we can't see. Great, so both cards are working. So I'm just going to, let's pop this video card out of here. This thing holds onto cards very tightly. I need to test the other motherboard. So that means getting this card out of here, which is really hard. Oh. oh man.
So this motherboard is totally working. So I'll just draw a check mark right there. Excellent. All right, so we have the other motherboard. Now this one is pretty dusty. It's a little worse for wear. So besides the dust that's on here, the battery did leak, it caused some damage. It's minor, the battery was removed. That trace there is looking a little eaten up. And if we look at this copper backplate, it's got a little corrosion on there. Not a big deal. I would imagine this probably still totally works. The sticker's coming off there. And then just to reiterate for anyone who's shopping for motherboards, this motherboard will not work, and I repeat, will not work without this RAM card. Absolutely, there's no way, if you turn this on, if I put a video card in here, turn this on, it will be dead. Nothing will happen. You need RAM to make a, a PC do anything, and this will only work with a RAM card like this. This is the one that's made for this. You cannot use some other RAM card, like a 16-bit or 8-bit ISA, that will not work. You gotta use this. So just keep that in mind. If you're shopping, do you see a motherboard like this? If you don't see RAM, don't buy it. Okay, let's power it up. Got it, it's working. Look at that, same thing. British Rail, local systems. Uh, keyboard failure, oh, I forgot to plug the keyboard in, no problem. Yeah, same thing, working great. Nice and reliable system. I mean, the only negative about this particular board, it's a 386, 20 megahertz. It's pretty slow. That's not gonna be that much faster than a 386. The biggest benefit, of course, is you have 386 instructions and you can put two of these RAM cards to get more RAM. And I would imagine it's 32-bit data path to the memory, so that's good. But the speed's a little slow. There's a crystal oscillator right here that controls the speed of the processor. So it's theoretically, you could put a faster one and put a faster chip in here. But this chipset, you have to go check the data sheet on there just to make sure that it can even run at a high speed. All right, well, I'm gonna draw a check mark right here for this one, or a tick mark, considering this is a British computer, or it was, and this RAM card is, gets a tick mark as well. And so does the other one, which completely works. Tick. All right, we have the next motherboard. So this is that AST motherboard that goes with that other RAM card. This one that's sitting right here. This is a 286 10 megahertz. I don't think I realized that. So like the 386 boards, there's no RAM on this thing. So you absolutely need to install this card that matches this motherboard to get anywhere. I don't think AST ever sold motherboards on their own. They only sold peripheral cards to go into PCs, but they did sell their own computers, like a desktop and mini towers and stuff. And this has gotta be a motherboard out of one of those, which would kind of explain this custom RAM card that it uses. See right there, it's definitely compatible. And the other thing is, this has onboard ports and stuff. And there it is, see, there's a serial and parallel port next to the keyboard connector. There's the motherboard name, the Premium 286. Ooh, so fancy. I guess, how many pins are those? Are these floppy connectors? Or are these hard drive connectors? Um, for whatever reason, I can't quite tell. Here's an interesting chip. It's a 74LS612N. Look how big that is, 40 pin dip. That's interesting. Keyboard BIOS, so that's in the most computers up here. So this is a 16450, so this is the better serial controller. It's got a buffer inside, so it works a little bit better than that other 8250 that doesn't have a buffer. This here is gonna be the clock chip. This would be from the battery that was disconnected. This is a weird thing. This here is where the Mathco processor would go, and it's got this black thing in it, which looks like it has a resistor inside or a diode. That is it, there's no chip there. This thing does have space for four BIOS chips, but only two are populated. That's even and odd. That's very typical for a 286. ASC Premium, re ASC Research version 1.1. Chips and technology chipset on here. There's a 48 pin dip there. It's 10 megahertz. It's probably limited to 10 or 12 because of this chipset. I'd, I'd have to look that up to know for sure. And then these extra chips up here are for whatever these ports are. These have got to be, there's got to be floppy connectors and it has two. How weird is that? So enough waffling, let's uh, put the power to it and turn this on. My same warning about shopping for motherboards applies to stuff like this. Even if this motherboard came with the RAM card, where is it? It's right here. Ooh, it's got a big 
dent there. <laughs> no big deal, it can be bend that back. Even if it came with this RAM card, oh, look at that bodge on the back. That would be fine. The motherboard's probably gonna work. Doesn't have any battery damage. Let me just make sure this is over the power supply when I push it down. And here, the problem with this motherboard, even if it works, this is all super non-standard right here. That's not gonna fit in your case. You gotta put this in a case, it's not gonna work, not at all. Maybe if I desolder this, I could use this. I have no idea if this keyboard connector is even in the standard spot though. It may or may not be. So if you're shopping for AT motherboards, like a 286, don't buy one that's got extra ports on it. Only if it has the keyboard port. That's also my recommendation. All right, video card. Let's plug in this 8-bit one, even though we could use a 16-bit card. Just watch out for these cables here because this battery cable will get energized with five volts. So just don't let it touch anything, short anything out when you power it on. All right, here we go. Oh, we're not getting a video. We're not, oh, we got video. Yes, Premium 286 version 1.1 AST Research. Checks unfailed, of course. It does show the two megs of RAM that you would expect. Press Control Alt Escape for the BIOS. Here it is, AST Setup Utility. Who remembers this from when you had an AST back in the day? So it's got two floppies there, fixed disk. Looks like there is no way to type in those numbers. Nope, that is it, you're a stuck. So you really need a card with a BIOS on this particular thing, or you switch out the BIOS for a different one. 286s that usually works. That'll allow you to have a bit more flexibility here. So VGA, primary video, mono, that's weird. 10 megahertz or six megahertz, you control the speed. And that's it, there is just one page of settings and that is it, F10 to save, press F5 to confirm. And there it is, booting up, it's counting all two megs, unlike the 386, that's because this doesn't do the shadow memory. The memory is not mapped into that upper address space. All right, and it's not gonna work here, obviously. It's just gonna, no boot disk found, but that's understandable, there it is. So cool, that 286 works. And like I said, the biggest problem is these serial parallel ports here that would prevent this from possibly even going into any case that I have. This would have originally had an AST case from them that would be ready to accommodate these extra ports here, but a standard case is not gonna do it. You know what it might work in though? It's possible you could use this in an ATX case, actually, now that I think about it. And that's because ATX cases uh, like the opening for all the ports, somewhere around here, those might actually be fine. I mean, it wouldn't be a cover on there, of course, but it would actually work, potentially. Let me just grab one of these 3D6 motherboards, which is an AT standard, and let's just hold it up, align it. Oh, the keyboard port's not even in the right spot, so this wouldn't even work at all. Even if I remove these connectors, I can't use this in a, in a case. Maybe an ATX case, like I said, is possible. If you can believe it, the holes for the standoffs, most ATX cases, at least older ones, can accommodate an AT motherboard and they, it actually works. You'll need an adapter for the power supply, but it would work and of course you have the bigger opening. Maybe that would align, but clearly not in an AT case, this AST motherboard. Why do this? Why did they do this? I mean, it's probably easier for manufacturing, I guess, I don't know. So that's really unfortunate because this obviously works. Oh, put a tick mark on that that chip there, but it's so non-standard, <laughs> so I, can't, I can't even put this in a case. That's super disappointing. And all this RAM works as well, two megs of RAM. And we have one more motherboard and it's this one right here. This is an XT motherboard, an 8088. And there's the processor right there, 8088-1. I have it upside down, as Dave Jones would say, all the electrons are gonna fall out. This was certainly late in the game because I see 1989 date codes on things. And then as for the memory here, it looks like it's got, I guess it's got one meg, I don't know. These are 1C1000 chips and there's nine of them, so eight plus parity. Okay. Has room for additional RAM or maybe different types of chips for different amounts. We have some branding here, VIP. TXM slash 10-3, 
and under here M803210. Now that dash 10 here would signify 10 megahertz, but that's weird because 8088-1, which I think these only run at 4.77, isn't the dash two the one you need for the faster speeds? We have dip switches and jumpers, which are typical for configuration on an XT. They don't have a graphical BIOS. There is no way to save any settings, so they rely on these. Anyhow, this Mitsubishi chipset here, 8255, and who knows whatever's under there, must be some kind of a chipset that just really simplifies things on the motherboard. This thing's all pretty much TTL logic, except for these three chips. So that's clearly a chipset, BIOS chip. Who knows, extra BIOS? Don't know what this is. Maybe there's another chip. Okay, the stickers don't come off. Backside, oh, we got a little bodge. We got the original standoffs, those are handy. I'll put those in my little bin of standoffs. You need those if you're gonna build an AT motherboard into a case, you need those little plastic things. Well, let's uh, see if this works. So first I'm just gonna try it with this VGA card. It has to be configured for EGA or VGA to have this work. I will need to grab a keyboard because the keyboard that uh, this needs is an XT keyboard, not an AT keyboard. We'll just start without any keyboard first to see what happens. Oh, hey, it worked, look at that. Phoenix BIOS 2.52, 1988. Okay, it's counting to 640K. So I'm assuming if this has one meg on it, that extra RAM is either gonna be configurable as EMS memory, or it just gets thrown away and not used. Well, it's nice this works. Let's, let's see if I could get this CGA card working in here. I, I mean, I don't know what the switches are. In fact, it may just copy the switch settings from the regular XT, the IBM. Like they completely copied those. But we'll just try this, see if it, see if it works. This motherboard might be smart enough to detect the difference, who knows? Okay, RGB to HDMI is connected. Let's turn this on, see what we get. All right, we're getting an image there. It's flickering. Let's see if we can go fix that in the menu. Okay, I think this thing is running in MDA mode. That would explain. No, it's not happy here. What's going on? Oh, okay, there, there we go, stop flickering. Okay, so it's definitely outputting monochrome. That's what this card is configured for right now. And it definitely seems to be working. I mean, I haven't tested all the functions, but hey, it's actually showing signs of life, which is a good sign. I'm pretty sure this card probably works perfectly. It's, Typical that these work. I, I don't know. I don't really ever have problems with these. So yeah, pretty cool. So I'm just gonna put a check mark on this because that works. And I'm gonna put one on the motherboard too, because that works. And then what's left to look at is just a few of the other things that he sent along. So here's a few of them. So we have a network card, PCI network card. Nothing particularly interesting to see there. The thermo engine. Super CPU cooler for the Athlon 1.4 Pentium 3, that era of cooler. Let's pop this out. This is always useful. Looks like it was actually used on something, but a lot of copper there, actual copper. This thing's got some, some heft to it. Cooler master fan. I don't think that's actually, <laughs> that's not the cooler that would have been in this box. This looks more like it's a cooler for a Pentium, which is actually more useful because I don't really have these systems, Pentium 3s and stuff. Not my wheelhouse, but if this is for the original Pentium stuff, like Socket 7, very useful. It says Cooler Master right on the sides. And then there's also this. This is some mega cooler, super silent Fujiyama, $29.99. Ooh, it's a Cooler Master. This thing is beefy. Big, chunky fan. This thing weighs a ton. It's got heat pipes in there. These brackety things. We're gonna have to look to see what this is even for. The Silent Socket 478 fan. I'd have to look up what that is. 478, I don't know, Pentium 4, something like that. Here's the tie that was sent along. So it has an Acorn logo, LVL. What's LVL? Does anyone know what that's all about? Tie's definitely on the older side of things, so it, it needs a wash. A little bit of an acorn logo there around the neck as well. And on the back here, and there's the logo, the Thai Specialist, the UK flag. All right. Yeah, it's a little crusty just because it's, it's very old. Kind of cool though. And we have a couple joysticks. This one here is for the PC. 
This one is a quick shot. It's got some knobs on the side here and it's funny that the quick shot logo is the opposite direction, it's facing away. So like if you're playing with this, whoever's looking at you could see that, that's, that's weird. Turbo fire on and off, got knobs, has buttons on the base too, so you don't need to use these triggers if you don't, you don't want. And it has suction cups that still work pretty well. Quick shot model QS201. And the other one is also a quick shot. There it is, slightly different model. It's got some A and B thing on the bottom. Maybe that disables the springs. The auto, not auto right there. Non-clicky buttons. Also for the PC, connector has been broken, but um, that should still work totally fine. Maybe that's not broken. And a mega bag of cables. Look at this, tons of cables, super helpful. Big, huge, scuzzy one, very nice. And then this is a floppy cable, very desirable type that I like because it's got both edge connector and the pin connector. So three and a half inch at five and a quarter inch on both positions and it's relatively long. These are kind of hard to come by these days. So that's that's very useful. And here's another one, also double connector, very nice. Also pretty long, which is excellent. Here's the one of the more typical ones that I get on really old computers. It's just got the edge connector. So if you want to hook up a three and a half inch, you need an adapter or you have to crimp on a connector like this, one of these pin connectors. And that's, you can still buy these, 34 pin, you can crimp them on. So you can convert these into being more useful, but it's harder to find these edge connectors, especially with the little thing in them. They were very common back in the old days, but not so much these days. This here is probably for that CGA cards, parallel port. These are MFM hard drive cables. This is like half of the cable you need to hook it up to the hard drive. And then here is the other half. And then this cable here, you think it might be a floppy cable, right? It's got two edge connectors in that. But it's actually not because the twist is different. And to be honest, this one was also a hard drive controller cable. I almost missed that. The twist for floppies is this set of wires here. Notice this is less and it's further over to the side. So that's how you tell the difference between a floppy cable and hard drive controller cables. So be careful not to mix those up because these will not work with a floppy drive, especially because that's the A drive on the end. That would be the A floppy drive. And you cannot use a floppy drive cable for a hard drive, typically. We have another SCSI cable. That is excellent. Serial port. I guess this is an IDE cable, though it's got multiple pins that are blocked off. So I'm not quite sure about that. This is a splitter cable plus a floppy adapter cable. Very useful. We have another serial thing. And this here is for floppy drive. This is a floppy drive cable here that just has the edge connectors, different than the hard drive ones I was just showing. And I think that's everything that Philip sent. There was a couple books, which I put somewhere, I can't find them right now, so yeah, I won't show those. But yeah, this is all the PC hardware. Some really great, useful stuff in here. Um, thank you very much, Philip, for sending that huge box with all of this stuff, very useful. And with that, I'm gonna end this video here. Once again, thanks to Philip for sending all that stuff into the mail call. If there's anything here that a lot of viewers want me to take a deeper look at, put your comments down below in the comments section. Maybe I'll have time to go and do a deeper dive or that might show up on the second channel. I'd like to give a shout out and a big thank you to all my patrons who have been supporting me. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen right here. And if you'd like to see your name in this scrolling list, you can click the Patreon link below and become a patron to support the digital basement. There are some cool features. You get access to videos before I post them online for everyone else to see. It's also easier to get a hold of me because I prioritize communication with my patrons um, versus my channel email, which I'm seemingly always really behind on. So if you've emailed me there and I haven't gotten back to you, I do apologize. It's just, it's kind of at the lowest priority for things I do on the channel between making the videos and editing and mail call and <laughs> Patreon and all that stuff. So. Again, I, I'm sorry about that. Don't forget to check out and subscribe to my second channel if you haven't already done so. I put videos up there about twice a week or so. It's kind of different content, but similar to what I do here, but shorter videos or a little less edited, a little more off the cuff, so to speak. And I think that's gonna be it. So stay healthy, stay safe, 
and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.